what the consequences are in the real world to our interest, I don't think we can take that chance. And so I would uh, oppose the uh, amendment of the senator from Kentucky. Mr. President? The senator from South Carolina. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, rise in support of uh, the statements made by Senator McCain and Levin. Um, I don't have that good a feeling about Iraq, quite frankly. I'm not very confident at all that the worst is behind us. I'm hopeful that we can withdraw our troops and nothing bad will happen in Iraq. But as Senator Levin just described, the implications of repealing the authorization to use military force are wide, varied, and uncertain. And what do you get by repealing this? You can go back home and say you did something that I don't know what you get. I mean, I really don't. I, I don't know what we gain as a nation by mm -hmm. taking the contingencies of using military force off the table as we try to wind down. I just don't see the upside, quite frankly. I know the reality of what our troops face and why the Department of Defense would want to continue to have this authorization until we get a rock behind us. And at the end of the day, 4,400 people plus have lost their lives. Thousands have been wounded and maimed, not counting the Iraqis who've lost their lives and been wounded and maimed to try to create order out of chaos. So as we move forward as a body, I just don't see the upside to those who are doing the fighting and who have to deal with the complications of this long protracted war by us repealing the authorization at a time when it may be necessary to have it in place. And if there's any doubt in your mind about what Senator Levin and McCain say and the Department of Defense says about the need for this to continue, I would ask you to give the doubt and the benefit to the Department of Defense. You don't have to. I just think that is a wise thing to do because what we gain by repealing it, I'm not sure what that is in any real sense. By having the authorization in place for a while longer, I do understand how that could potentially help those who are fighting uh, in Iraq and the follow-on needs that come as we transition. So I would just ask the body to be cautious. And if you've got any doubt that Senator McCain and Levin's concerns are real, I would think now would be the time to defer to the Department of Defense and give them the tools they need to finish out our operations in Iraq. And I would close with this one thought. The vacuum created by the fact that we won't have any troops in 2012 can be filled in a very bad way if we don't watch it. The Kurd Arab problem could wind up in open warfare. The Iranian influence is growing in Iraq as I speak. And we do have troops and civilian personnel in the country, and we will have a lot next year. I just think out of an abundance of caution, that we ought to leave the tools in place uh, that Department of Defense says they need to finish this out. So I would urge my colleagues to err on the side of giving the Department of Defense the authorization they need to protect those who are going to be left behind. Thank you. The Senator from Kentucky. It disappoints me that President Obama opposes a formal end to the Iraq War but it doesn't surprise me. As a candidate, President Obama was outspoken against the war and for ending the war. He will be bringing the troops home, but this vote and this debate is not about necessarily just bringing the troops home. This is a debate over power. The executive branch wants to keep the unlimited power to commit troops to war. This is about who holds the power. The Founding Fathers intended that Congress should hold the power. This vote is about whether we will continue to abdicate that power and give that power up to the executive. That allows for no checks and balances. We need to have checks and balances. It's what our founding fathers intended. With regard to defending ourselves, there is authorization for the president to always defend the nation using force. There is authorization for every embassy around the world to defend the embassy, and that's why we have soldiers there. We also have agreements with the host country that the host military is supposed to support the embassy, and if that fails, we have our own soldiers. We have these agreements around the world.
There's nothing to say that we can't use force, but what this says is we're reclaiming the power to declare war, and we will not have another war with hundreds of thousands of troops without a debate. Should not the public debate? Should not Congress debate before we commit troops to war? This war is coming to a close. I suggest we should be proud of it, and I hope people will support this amendment. I'd like to yield my remaining time to the senator from Oregon. Mr. President. The senator from Oregon. Mr. President, I rise in support of Senator Paul's amendment to revoke the war authority. We have heard on this floor that the consequences of revoking authority are vague and uncertain. Indeed, my team has been seeking a reply from the Department of Defense uh, quite some time now as to whether there were any conditions that we should be alerted to where this would, would create a problem. And here at the last minute, we appear to have a memo, a memo that has not come to my office, that says there are possible complications. Well, let's be clear. The executive branch never wants to hand back authority it has been granted. It always wants to retain the maximum flexibility. But as my colleague has pointed out, this is an issue of constitutional authority. We had a constitutional discussion about authorizing action in Iraq, and certainly, contrary to my opinion, this body supported that action. But now the President is bringing this war to an end. And doesn't it make sense, then, that we end the authority that went with this war and call a formal end to this battle? The issue has been raised, but there might be something that happens in the future. Isn't that true for every country on this planet, that something might happen in the future? Something might happen in Somalia. Something might happen in Yemen. Something might happen any nation in the world. And indeed, under the War Powers Act, the President has the ability to respond immediately. It doesn't need to come to this body for 60 days. So there's extensive flexibility that would go with Iraq, just as it goes with every other country, in addition to the authority that has been granted to pursue al-Qaeda and associated forces around the world. When, if not now, should we revoke this authority? Do we say that once granted at any point and any time in the future, the administration can go back to war without the authorization of this body. Well, I can tell you that it is time for us to reclaim the authority of Congress, and should the circumstances arise that the President feels the need to go to back into a war mode versus many of the other uses of force that are already authorized under other provisions, then he would have 60 days. And he could come back to this body and say, these are the changed circumstances. And under the Constitution, will you grant the power to renew or create a new force of war in that country? And we can hold that debate in a responsible manner. But this open-ended commitment under these circumstances does not make sense. Congress has yielded its authority under the Constitution far too often to the executive branch. So many times this body has failed to do its fair share under our constitutional framework. This amendment that before us today makes sense in the context of the withdrawal of troops and provides plenty of flexibility to undertake any security issues that might arise in the future. And for that reason, I urge my colleagues to support the Paul Amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Who yields time? To call for the yeas and nays at this point, or do we have a, a, it is. an agreement? I ask for the yeas and nays to be recorded. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The yeas and nays have been ordered. The clerk will call the roll.
The senator from Kentucky has four minutes remaining. Uh, yield back my time. Mr. President. The senator from Louisiana. Mr. President, I think under the previous order we were going to debate both amendments and then have a vote in just a few moments is what I understood. The senator is correct. Thank you, Mr. President. I know this is a very important well, yes, senator, you have senator to, uh, from Arizona. But how long would the senator take? Ten minutes Ten or minutes. five minutes. And perhaps we could have votes shortly thereafter? No, they're scheduled. Yeah. Yeah, the senators have done such a good job managing this bill. We could maybe vote in the next few minutes. That would be terrific. And thank you, Senator McCain and Senator Levin. I really appreciate the opportunity to offer this amendment and be paired with an important amendment that the senator from Kentucky and the senator from Oregon have offered. And I'll taste, take five minutes to explain it because a longer explanation would not be necessary because I think the body is very, very familiar with the reauthorization of the SBIR program. And the reason that I believe that the chairman and the ranking member allowed uh, me to offer this amendment with my colleague, Senator Snow, is twofold. One, it does have a bearing on the Department of Defense in that, Mr. President, the Department of Defense is the largest contributor to the SBIR and STTR program, which are the two most important research and development programs for small business that the federal government runs and operates. And Senator Levin and Senator McCain know full well the importance for the Department of Defense and therefore extrapolate correctly the importance of this program for all of our agencies. We take a small portion of the research and development dollars for all of the federal agencies and we basically direct it to small business. And there's some good reasons, and I'd like to just put in the record a few. As written by one of the advocates supporting the program, she writes, and I'm going to put this into the record, the SBIR and STTR funding award process spawns competition among high-tech businesses. Scientists and engineers propose their best technological concepts to solve problems of national interest. The best of the best of these concepts are selected for funding. Thus, this funding mechanism assures that thinking minds continuously work on producing the most practical solutions to engineering problems. And whether it's our soldiers in the field, Mr. President, or whether it's our scientists at NASA, or whether it's our scientists and engineers struggling to understand the oceans or better communication technology, they go to the SBIR and STTIR program. They look for some of the cutting edge ideas. We invest in them, and then many of those ideas go commercial for the benefit of everyone, taxpayers included. She goes on to write that small businesses develop niche products that are not mass produced overseas. Thus, it helps our employment situation right here at home. The employees of a high-tech company are highly educated professionals belonging to high-income groups who contribute substantially to the tax pool and the economy. And finally, one other reason. She says small businesses, which I agree with, are job creators. We hear that large companies are sitting on trillions of dollars in cash, not yet investing. Small businesses often operate on very thin to no profit margins and hire staff on borrowed money. This is because growth is the mantra for small business for survival. If they don't grow, they don't survive. And so this small business research program, Mr. President, is so important. The reason I'm here tonight asking my colleagues to vote on this amendment on the defense bill, it is relevant. It's also important. And Mr. President, we're five years late. This program should have been authorized five years ago. Now, I inherited the situation when I became chairman of the Small Business Committee, and as you know, I've been working diligently with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to move this debate forward, to move to advance the ball. That's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to hopefully pass this with more than the 60 votes necessary. This bill came out of the Small Business Committee on a vote of 17 to 1. It was just broadly bipartisan in its appeal. It is uh, sponsored by my ranking member, Senator Snow, who's been one of the strongest advocates for small business in this Senate 
not just for this year, but for many years. She sponsors this bill along with Senators, um, uh, with Senator Shaheen and Senator Brown are also co-sponsors and Senator Kerry of this bill. So with Senator McCain's help, Senator Levin's help, and the co-sponsors of this amendment, I ask my colleagues to vote favorably for it tonight. Again, we are five years uh, overdue. It's an important rise, so the folks operating our programs at all the departments have some confidence that the program is going to go on, that they can even do a better job than they have been doing, and we can get these investments out to the small businesses that are game changers, Mr. President, game changers in America, creating new technologies, and most importantly, creating the jobs that America needs right here at home. So I don't see anyone else to speak on the amendment. I think that would probably be all the time that we need. I hope that's a signal that there's no opposition uh, to this amendment, and perhaps we could either do voice vote or we could have a very strong vote for reauthorizing the small business research program, again, that is uh, so meritorious and so necessary for the investment in small business in America today. And I yield the floor and return the balance of my time. The, the senator from Michigan. Mr. President, first, uh, and well, Senator Landrieu is here because uh, she, uh, I know, is going to be interested in, in this and is right on top of this. But I want to assure her that this unanimous consent uh, proposal is being made now. It was our intention, with the previous order, to have the Landrieu Amendment 1115 modified with the changes that are at the desk, and I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be modified with those changes, and that our previous order with respect to the vote in relation to the Landrieu Amendment be modified as well. Is there objection? Without objection. Now, Mr. President, while I uh, have the floor and while Senator Landrieu is here, let me uh, just add my voice of uh, Thanks and gratitude to Senator Landrieu for the energy that she shows as chair of our small business committee. I'm honored to be a member of that committee and to sit at her side. I know how long and hard she has worked on this SBIR program, how many years uh, that we have fought hard for this program with her being our leader. Uh, the same thing is true with the uh, technology program, the small business technology transfer program, which is part of this amendment. Uh, this bill is going to help 30 million small businesses to invest in technology research to help grow their businesses, spur innovation, create jobs. Small business uh, technology firms that received SBIR funds have produced 38 percent of America's patents, 13 times more than large businesses, and employ 40 percent of America's scientists and engineers. And the Defense Department is the bigger user, the biggest user of these programs. And so uh, this really is very appropriate on this bill. Uh, and uh, we're very glad that the determination of uh, Senator Landrieu and her co-sponsors, and I, if I'm not already a co-sponsor of the amendment, I would ask that I be added as a co-sponsor, uh, has made it Without possible uh, for us to uh, be here uh, tonight. And uh, I just wanted to say that while she was on the floor and express what I think is if not the unanimous, the near unanimous gratitude of this body, because I expect this will have an overwhelming vote. And by the way, Mr. Mr. President, could uh, I, I would ask unanimous consent also that our presiding officer, uh, Senator Casey, be added as a co-sponsor to our counterfeit parts amendment. Um, it took us too many weeks to do this, but as I see the presiding officer in the chair, I'm making up for lost time and asking unanimous consent that he be added as co-sponsor. Is there objection? Without objection. And I yield the floor. We yield time.
Mr. President. The Senator from Arizona. I ask unanimous consent for the proceedings on the quorum call be suspended. Without objection. I yield back the balance of my time. All time is yielded back. Under the previous order, the question occurs on amendment number. Under the previous order, the question occurs on amendment number 1064 offered by the senator from Kentucky, Mr. Paul. The yeas and nays have been ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka, Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayat, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Baucus, Mr. Begich, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, Mr. Brown of Ohio, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins, I have Mr. Conrad, Mr. Coons, Mr. Corker, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Dement, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Mrs. Feinstein, Mr. Franken, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch, Mr. Heller, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hutchison, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Inoue, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Carey, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Cole, Mr. Kyle, Ms. Landrew, Mr. Lautenberg, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin. Mr. Lieberman. Mr. Luger. Mr. Manchin. Mr. McCain. Yes. Mrs. McCaskill. Mr. McConnell. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley. Ms. Mikulski. Mr. Moran. Ms. Murkowski. Mrs. Murray. Mr. Nelson of Nebraska. Mr. Nelson of Florida. Mr. Paul. Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Sessions, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, <coughs> Ms. Snow, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall of Colorado, Mr. Udall of New Mexico, Mr. Vitter, Mr. Warner, Mr. Webb, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden. Mr. Paul voted in the affirmative. Senators voting in the negative. Alexander, Coates, Graham, 
Isaacson, Landrieu, and Sessions. Mr. Levin, no. Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin. Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, no. McCain. Mr. McCain. No. Luger. Mr. Luger, no. Mr. Reed, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, no. Mr. Whitehouse, no. Mrs. Murray, aye. Brown of Massachusetts, no. Mr. Shelby, Mr. Shelby, no. 
Mr. Pryor. No. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Manchin. Aye. Mr. Leahy. Mr. Leahy. Aye. Mr. Conrad. Mr. Conrad, no. Mr. Vitter. Mr. Vitter, no. Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rockefeller, aye. Mrs. Hutchison. Mrs. Hutchison, no. Mr. Casey. Mr. Casey, no. Mr. Tester. Mr. Tester, aye. Mr. Coburn. Mr. Coburn, no. Mr. Kirk, no. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Bozeman, no. <laughs> Mr. Kyle. Mr. Kyle, no. Mrs. Boxer. Mrs. Boxer, aye. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts, no. Mr. Udall of New Mexico, aye. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Cardin, aye. Mr. Cochran. Mr. Cochran, no. Mr. McConnell. Mr. McConnell, no. Mr. Franken. Mr. Franken. Aye. Wyden. Mr. Wyden, aye. Mr. Dement, Mr. Dement, aye. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, no. Mr. Chambliss. Mr. Chambliss, 
No. Mr. Warner. Mr. Warner, no, Mr. Baucus. Mr. Baucus, aye. Ms. Collins, Ms. Collins, no, Mr. Heller. Mr. Heller, aye. Mr. Webb, Mr. Webb, no. Mr. Wicker, no. Mr. Johans. Mr. Johans. No. Ms. Ayotte. Ms. Ayotte. No. Mr. Durbin. Aye. Ms. Cantwell, aye. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Menendez, aye. Mr. Hatch. Mr. Hatch. No. Miss Snow. Miss Snow. I. Mr. Corker. Mr. Corker, no. Mr. Harkin. Mr. Harkin, aye. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blumenthal, no. Mr. Grassley. Mr. Grassley, no. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Cornyn, no. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders, Aye. Mr. Lieberman. Mr. Lieberman. No. Mr. Enzi. Mr. Enzi. No. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Toomey. No. Mr. Nelson. Mr. Nelson of Nebraska. Aye. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown of Ohio. Aye. Mr. Inhofe. Mr. Inhoff, no. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, no. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson of Florida, no. Mr. Burr, Mr. Burr, no. Mr. Portman, Mr. Portman, no. Mr. Akaka. Mr. Akaka, no.
Mr. Carey. Mr. Inouye. Mr. Inouye, no. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Barrasso, no. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Crapo, no. Mr. Rish. Mr. Rish, no. Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee, no. Mr. Thune. Mr. Thune, no. Ms. Mikulski. Ms. Mikulski, no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Carper. Mr. Carper, no. Bingaman. Mr. Bingaman, no. Mr. Coons. Mr. Coons, no. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Rubio, no. Mrs. Hagen. Mrs. Hagen. No. Mr. Blunt. No. Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed of Nevada, no. Mr. Lautenberg, no. Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer, no. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mrs. Gillibrand, aye. Mr. Merkley, aye. Mr. Moran, Mr. Moran, no. Ms. Mrs. McCaskill, aye. Mr. Bingaman. Can I get a water, please? Mr. Bingaman. Can I get I. Mr. Carey. Mr. Carey. No.
Mrs. Feinstein. Aye. Mr. Udall. Mr. Udall of Colorado, no. Ms. Klobuchar, aye. Mr. Lautenberg, aye. Mr. Udall of Colorado, aye. Yes, you did. Ms. Stabenow. Ms. Stabenow, no. Are there any senators in the chamber wishing to vote or to change their vote? If not on this vote, the yeas are 30, the nays are 67. Under the previous order requiring 60 votes for the adoption of this amendment, the amendment is not agreed to. The Majority Leader. The Senate will be in order. The Majority Leader vote of this evening. Tomorrow we're going to have a vote around 11 o'clock on cloture on this bill and uh, we'll work with the managers to see how they're going to work through the germane amendments. Under the, under, under the pre previous order there will now be two minutes of debate equally divided on the Landrieu amendment. Mr. President, can we have order please? The Senate will come to order. Please take your conversations from the well. Mr. President, thank you very much. We only will take a minute. I'd like to yield the majority of my time to the ranking member who has worked so hard on this bill. I want to thank all the members of the Senate for working on the S. The, the Senator will suspend. The Senate will come to order. The Senator from Louisiana is recognized. I'd like to thank the co-sponsors and thank all of my colleagues for supporting
a very balanced extension of the SBIR program. This is five years overdue, and I yield the remainder of my time to the ranking member from the state of Maine. Mr. President. The Senator from Maine. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I want to thank the Chair of the Small Business Committee, Chair Landrew, for her leadership, and I commend her for that, and for all those who are supporting. The Senator from Maine. And for all the members of the Senate for supporting uh, these two vital programs. We had much debate on the, these programs back uh, in March for five weeks. Uh, there has been broad bipartisan support. They are vital job creators and innovators. Uh, they have provided more than 25 percent of the innovations that have occurred over this last decade and certainly vital uh, to the Defense Department where we're setting aside existing federal research dollars for small business firms. And for our nation's largest SBIR agency, the Department of Defense, it provides from night vision goggle simulators to sensors and to other Senator, intelligence that's provided to our brave Mr. men President, and women on the field. Thank you. Such bipartisan support. Why do we need a roll call vote? There was someone on that side who wanted to think. Do we have to have a roll call vote? The unanimous consent agreement requires 60 votes. You can try to get, I ask, I ask unanimous consent, that order be vitiated. Is there objection? Without objection. The question is on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The amendment is agreed to. The, the amendment as modified is agreed to. Senator from New Jersey. The Senate will come to order. The Senator from New Jersey is President, on roll call vote 210, I voted no. It was my intention to vote aye. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that I be permitted to change my vote since it will not affect the outcome. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kalkow. about the bill the National Guard. Mr. President. The Senator from Rhode Island. Mr. President, if it's in order, I'd like to speak on the bill. The Senate's in a quorum call. The Senate will come to order. Mr. President, I would ask you to consent to dispense with the calling of the quorum. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh... the Senate will be in order. Please take your conversations from the well. The Senator from Rhode Island is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, last evening we passed the uh, Leahy-Graham Amendment, 
which would uh, by law make the uh, head of the National Guard Bureau a member of the Joint uh, Chiefs of Staff. As we go forward in our deliberations with respect to this bill, particularly the conference committee, I think... The Senate will be in order. Please take your conversations from the well. The Senator from Rhode Island is once again recognized. Mr. President, I thank you and I thank the Senator from Delaware. Uh, I am, as I indicated, uh, would like to make some comments about how I think we can improve and clarify the legislation that was adopted last evening uh, by voice vote. But first, let me begin by recognizing, obviously, the extraordinary contribution of the men and women of our National Guard. I speak from the experience of just a few weeks ago visiting uh, members of the 43rd Military Police Brigade of the Rhode Island National Guard who have the responsibility for the detention facility in Bagram, Afghanistan. Under the able leadership of Brigadier General Charlie Petrarca, they are doing an extraordinary job. Uh, I also was able to talk with some of the members of our Air National Guard, the 143rd Wing. This is the finest C-130J wing in the entire United States Air Force, National Guard, or active or reserve, in my estimate. Uh, they are doing remarkable work. In fact, we could not continue the operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, our homeland security obligations, uh, without the men and women of the National Guard. I want to also just say, uh, coincidentally, I had the great opportunity to sit down with my Adjutant General, Kevin McBride. And General McBride and his staff are extraordinarily effective professionals. I first got the chance to see him in literally action when he commanded the 43rd Military Police Brigade in Iraq, where they also had detention responsibilities. So we're talking about now a component of our military forces. 